So now I would like to discuss um, the sort of stratification of classes here in the colonies, right? Because as they get wealthier, we do see more specific divisions uh, of labor, of occupation, of wealth, and of political status. You know, one thing about the 17th century, you know, outside of the planter, you know, planter classes in Virginia and Maryland, but most of the colonies, um, there wasn't that great of a differentiation between the wealthiest and the poorest, right? If you look at New England, there was a lot of commonality. But what comes along with economic success and diversification and immigration is social stratification. And, you know, who the elites are, you know, that was somewhat predetermined in the planter society, uh, you know, of Virginia's and the Carolinas. But for the rest of the colonies, the, the, the elites will take shape and their culture and how they identify themselves it becomes a reality in the 18th century. And so we're going to look at this a little bit. And I'm going to use the whiteboard to see if I can highlight it a little. You know, one of the things about the colonies that has to be said, is we think about it as a place of opportunity and how we differentiate it from Europe in the old world is there was a comment made uh, in the 18th century by a visitor and an observer who said, you know, in the, in the colonies, wealth, he says, wealth equals status. He says that a man here who has money Regardless of birth, he is everything. And, you know, that seems to be a sentiment that's still alive and well. However, you have to understand how that's a departure. You know, in Europe, even in 18th century Europe, wealth wasn't quite enough. Wealth was great, but it didn't necessarily confer status. There still was nobility, title, land, that leadership, and to be deserving of, of, of popular deference and respect came from a different traditional source. You were born with it. You were royalty, you were nobility, you had a landed title, right? Even when the wealthy merchants became wealthier than the landed nobility, there's a real struggle in Europe for acceptance as a political leadership class, right? There's a reason why, even after they become a fairly modern democracy in England, they keep the monarchy, right? Because it still appealed to these basic understandings of who the leaders were. It still worked with the cultural expectations and traditional understandings of status. The colonies, in this way, are truly our new world. Status still matters, but you got to self-fashion your status. It didn't come with you from England. In fact, even if you were a nobleman in England when you came here, this was definitely true in the 17th century, but still in the 18th, you didn't necessarily retain that. You actually needed the wealth to sustain it. Right, to become part of this sort of new world nobility. So who is the new world nobility? Where does everyone stand? Well, make a little bit of a social pyramid here. The very, very top, right, we'll call them the gentry, the greater gentry. And a gentry just means nobility. And remember, you couldn't inherit this title. Right? So the American gentry is different in that you had to earn it and keep earning it. Right? You had to preserve that wealth, right, that, that you're political. But the gentry, like the gentry in the old world, does have political influence, did have inordinate social influence, right, uh, did receive respect and deference, certain privileges that lower classes didn't receive, even in the colonies. You know, they're the top of society. Then they probably represented, you know, between 1% and 2% of the whole population. Who were they? They're your great merchants, like big, powerful merchants who own their own fleet. They're your plantation owners, especially the rice cultivators. And another group of people who are among the wealthiest class, and we haven't talked about them at all, are uh, these large, large, large landowners who made their money from rents, who actually weren't engaged in a very modern economy at all, but a very old-fashioned economy in that they owned huge tracts of land in which people lived on it and farmed, and paid them rent, right? And as though that's, even though that's not the most ambitious and dynamic and forward-looking economy to pursue, right, source of wealth, it turned out to be one of the greatest sources of wealth back in history and, and now, right? The landlord wealth. Uh, the largest group of these guys, I'm just going to let you know, were called the Patroons. They were in the Hudson River Valley of New York, right? And they owned these huge, vast, vast, vast estates all up and down the Hudson River Valley uh, that had you know, thousands of farming families living on them, paying them rent. So 
These are your upper class guys. This is the true, incredibly wealthy gentry. You know, and in some ways, this upper gentry, they're not the dynamic political class. They're so wealthy, so removed, so sure of their status that they stood apart from colonial economy, right? Many of these guys during a revolution will remain loyalists, right? They, their status is almost removed from everyone else's, right? That's a level of wealth and power um, that is almost removed from the everyday politics. Political leadership would come from this next class by and large. Some of the members of the gentry obviously will be political leaders as well, but the more dynamic one is this, we'll call them the lesser gentry. Right. And maybe, I don't know, somewhere between six to 10% of the population. There's no hard and fast numbers for determining this. But this is a class of wealthy, educated men with families uh, who came into existence because of this dynamic 18th century colonial economy, right? They're merchants. They're just not the greatest of merchants, but they're guys engaged in international global trade. They are lawyers. Uh, ministers were considered part of this class, status-wise more than, than income, of course. Uh, you know, they're bankers, uh, they're skilled craftsmen who own and run their own shops, right? They were large um, shopkeepers, you know, who owned larger shops, right? This sort of wealthier dynamic class. And as you can see, they're the upwardly mobile class. They don't have this massive, you know, plantation or patroon, you know, rent-driven wealth. But they are wealthier than the others. They're usually urban dwelling in many cases. Um, and you know, they will be the most ambitious, the ones who need political status, who want to be the new nobles and have this noblesse oblige and work on behalf of the middling and the lower classes and represent them in their ideological and economic and personal struggles against you know, intrusions by the empire. In fact, these are the two classes who make up you know, the political elites. And what's interesting is we see in throughout the 18th century, and as we move along, this happens more and more, growth in a common cultural identity among these political elites, among this elite class, right? That, you know, the wealthy in the earliest part of the 18th century didn't really think about wealthy people and, and people like them in the other colonies or other cities, unless they maybe were business partners. But with the advent of writing and communication and shared books and shared ideas uh, and shared political goals, we see more commonality among these, that the elite merchant class of Boston begins to actually be in communication or at least have similar cultural tastes and attitudes uh, as the elite merchant class in Philadelphia, right? And this becomes more of a transcolonial experience, right? We see the sort of seeds of, I don't want to say a national identity, because that wouldn't be right, but certainly a trans-regional identity uh, that had some staying power, that had meaning, that was motivational. And they do a couple of things that define them as elites, you know, especially among this lesser gentry. You know, they're very self-conscious about their status. They want to be political leaders. They don't quite have the fabulous wealth to absolutely claim themselves to be, arist to be aristocrats. Um, and they don't have, you know, they're not aristocrats like they would be in the traditional world. And what they do is uh, they engage in uh, something, uh, Thorsten Veblen, social theorist from another generation called conspicuous consumption. Conspicuous consumption. It's a great phrase. It's the idea that by, through the things that you purchase and own, you define yourself. That you can define your status through the things you buy and own. Most importantly, the things that you buy and own and have and wear have to be seen by others. So that the middling classes, the other classes, share in your self-definition. Right, so if I want to look like a noble, I want everyone to know my status, I have to dress a certain way. I have to have the finest dyed clothes imported from Europe. Right? I have to build my houses in the style of European architecture. In fact, if I can, I'll try to get European masons to come over and do the stonework. I will import art. I will commission art of my children having portraitures just the way an aristocrat might do in London or in Paris.
right? They begin to spend in such a way. They build their houses in the cities with fairly uh, uh, elaborate facades, right where everyone would see them. There's this whole new kind of uh, approach to spending money, participating, because they're not just producers and suppliers in this new rising global colonial markets. They're participants as consumers. In fact, it's part of the reason the global market is growing, right? It's not that just England takes these goods and ships them to England. They turn them into great manufactured items, luxury items half the time, that they sell back to people in the colonies, right? That's the two-way street of mercantilism. And among this gentry, they're spending more and more. They are conspicuously buying. One of the things that ties them together that forges this common identity isn't just political, right, or philosophical, although that does come into play. It's also something a little more base. They have similar consumptive habits and tastes for the same reason that to convince those in the city or in the large towns, you are of a noble status. You are a person of worth and wealth who should be respected. You had to look the part. You had to have these things. Right? And they think of it that way. This is what you do when you achieve this status. And this takes off. You know, this is sort of the rise of fashion in the colonies. It had already happened in Europe. But it's the same sort of thing. Because what happens is, you know, in the city you get this lesser gentry buying a certain clothes or building a certain house. Well, when some of the lower classes got some money, what would they do? They'd imitate it. They'd buy similar stuff. And as they got aware of this, they'd have to differentiate themselves. They would change style and tastes, right? That's that cycle of conspicuous consult, consumption that drives fashion, right? Um, it's driven by fashion, you know, and this is also helps to heat up the colonial economy as well as the global economy, right? That this uh, idea, this connection between uh, consumption for status or for reasons other than need is actually good for the economy and actually does have an effect on society, a, a social cultural effect. And that's how they're defining themselves. Underneath them, we want to have something, what to call these guys is hard. I'm going to use the more common phrase of middle class. Labor historians, Marxist historians, and social historians of another generation would recoil at my use of that word. And I will tell you why. It's, and I want to be clear. We're not talking about a managerial class of people here. Right? There's no widespread industry or corporations where there's middle management, right? Or this educated class that's still working for salaries, right? That's this idea of a middle class. And that's kind of, um, as far as America is concerned, a late 19th century and 20th century creation, right? And we see the rise of this middle class and with a specific political progressive ideology, right? Okay, I understand. Let's be clear. I'm just using middle class in that they are the middle. Right? Uh, some historians refer to them as the middling class, but I think that's a silly word. Middle class is fine, and I think uh, we understand what I'm talking about here. So who's in this middle class? Well, market farmers, family farmers who grew uh, enough to sell on a surplus, surplus and did pretty well. Craftsmen, uh, particularly skilled craftsmen who worked for someone else, but the value of their craft earned them a good wage. Uh, certain lawyers, small shopkeepers, Newspaper printers, right? All these other jobs that could exist that were reasonably good jobs that you could get paid for. Some of them are entrepreneurial, right? Some are just good skilled craftsman jobs, but they put you in this solid middle class. And what's important to know, there were definitely a high degree of social mobility relative to the rest of the world, okay, in 18th century colonial America. But by and large, while we did see people from lower classes achieve a great deal of wealth and create a political status that couldn't have existed anywhere else, for the most part. The wealthy remained the wealthy, okay, and most of the wealthy class had been born that way, right, and we continue to be born into it. That being said, the one class where we do see a lot of growth is here, this middle class. Its numbers swell. You know, it goes from anywhere from 20 to maybe even 40 percent, right, of the total population. And its numbers are constantly growing. And this is a good thing, because this is the dynamic class of people who can sustain themselves, participate in a global market, right? uh, have prospects, have plans, have families, be future looking. Right? This is the essence of the stable, progressive, forward moving society. And the fact that their numbers are growing from immigration, from people moving up, 
right? That's a good sign, and that is an important factor of the, uh, uh, of the 18th century's economic and social world. And in many ways, you know, the political interests of these elites will be mostly focused at winning the allegiance of this middle class. Right? That's really, particularly in the northern and the mid-Atlantic colonies, that's, this is where the connection is made more deeply. More so, you know, we've talked about the planter classes in Virginia where the differentiation of wealth is really, really extreme. But here in the north, it's the wedding of identity and cause between the middle class and this political wealthy class. Below them is another group of landowners, and they're called the yeoman farmers. You know, this is what most of the Scots-Irish would become, the sort of backcountry farmers. It's what the ex-indentured servants became in Virginia, a yeoman farmer. And what it basically means is you're a subsistence farmer. You own your own land. You have a family, and you work out on it. But either because of the size of the land, or your farming skill, or more than likely, uh, your geographic location, right? You don't really participate in markets. You're not really part of that global market agricultural economy um, that, that the market farmer is part of, right? And you're a yeoman farmer. It's still an interesting status, right? It's still a status that many, many, many people all across Europe would yearn to be. Owning my own land that provides for itself with a, with a high degree of independence because of your geographic location away from you know, the eastern seaport cities where the political elites are and, and where the colonial structures are, right? The yeoman farmer. But politically, economically, they're further down on the, on the stratified food chain. Below them is unskilled labor. You know, this isn't actually as big a group as you might think in the colonies. It probably only represents 10% of the population. And why it's a little different in the colonies is this. You know, for much of American history, we think of large masses of unskilled, landless labor being agriculturally focused. And after slavery, and as American agriculture expands across this continent, that's true. That is where, to this day, where the large uh, numbers of unskilled, um, you know, low-wage workers are found who won't, don't own land, right, is in agricultural pursuits. However, in colonial times, the unskilled labor was mostly focused, focused in urban areas. You know, in all those shipbuilding industries, in the iron foundries, in the shops of craftsmen, they had a high need for unskilled, cheap labor. And most of these people were young, mostly male, recent immigrants, uh, who would work on a day-to-day -day basis, a day-to-day -day wage. And what's interesting is, is the way this was organized, right? And this will sound somewhat familiar to uh, anyone familiar with labor relations in, in any urban setting. Uh, the way it worked was this, is that if you were an unskilled laborer, you belonged to basically what was a gang, a group. And that group had a leader. And your leader would basically go to the different shops or to shipbuilding yards or whatever and make deals. And he'd say like, hey, listen, um, we want, I want you to use these laborers. And he would broker the deal, he would get paid, he would then pay you from what he made, and that's how he made the deal. And what's interesting about that was there's a lot of competition, that these unskilled labor groups would actually fight with one another. And I mean literally fight with brickbats and clubs, fight for control of the right to be the unskilled laborers of a certain section of the city. Right? And this will continue all the way up into the Civil War era. And in fact, you know, all the way through um, you know, the late 19th century industrial era, this kind of uh, organized, you know, what is almost like organized crime groups, if you think about it, controlling unskilled labor, competing for the right to sell their labor. It's an interesting history in and of itself. And uh, again, it doesn't represent, what's interesting is, you know, other civilizations time, you might flip this number, where the middle class and the yeoman would be the much smaller number and the unskilled landless labor would be much larger. But the colonies, because it's dynamic, because there's a lot of available land, because of uh, mercantilism, they actually don't represent that large of a group. That most of the, the, even the immigrants who come over find a way into one of these other groups. At the very bottom, of course, is slavery. You know, and slavery, as I was just pointing out before when talking about iron foundries and rice cultivation, slavery wasn't necessarily unskilled. 
you know, many of the African slaves brought over highly marketable skills. They just weren't paid for them, right? They were oppressed and forced to work that way. But again, slavery represents 20% of, of the entire uh, colonies by, by 1770, by the time of the revolution. And that's a pretty good picture of how they were organized, how the social classes were, that these are the political elites. They're mostly interested in getting the, uh, you know, support of the middle class and to a lesser extent the yeoman farmers, right? This is in many ways the dynamic and the stable uh, and the most important part of a colonial uh, political public world. This is the part that will go, uh, will rebel against England, okay? So I just want to kind of establish who they were. One final point I want to go over is politics. So as I, we've talked about this a number of times, that every one of the colonies will have a locally elected legislature. The Assembly in New York, the General Court in Massachusetts, the House of Burgesses, right? They all have these elected bodies. And it'll be these political elites, particularly this lesser gentry, but also some of the true gentry, that will be elected into that and they will pitch and posit themselves as defenders of the rights of the middle classes and the yeoman farmers, right? Their, their rights as Englishmen, and we've talked about this a number of times. What should be said on the other side is, um, while this will eventually bleed into over time, you know, a fairly rich, dynamic, and ideologically satisfying democratic republic called the United States of America, I don't want you to think that's remotely what's happening at this point in time. You know, the best thing you could say to describe uh, political participation, you know, during this era is apathy, right? The middling classes and the yeomen really weren't that interested in politics. There's a lot of high-minded ideas and economic ideas and being thrown around by the political elites. And they certainly did a lot of, of um, selling themselves as defenders of, of the culture of the lower classes. But the lower classes, the middle classes, they were mostly concerned about making their own money, living their own lives. They are not, you know, it is not this sort of passionate uh, democratic republican movement that is creating these assemblies, these elected bodies. As a matter of fact, usually to get someone to come out and vote, what you had to do was ply them with alcohol. And that's not a joke. That is the God's honest truth, that they would throw these huge election day barbecues. You'd throw a big party, you know, and the candidates who wanted to be elected would, would, would underwrite the bill, right? They'd foot the money. They would bring tons of alcohol. They would give them food. They would do stump speeches, and then they would vote. And it really was much more, people would come more because it was public spectacle, spectacle and, a, and a celebration, and, and there was alcohol. They were giving away free alcohol. You know, there was a, one historian made the argument or pointed out that it was estimated that when George Washington was, was first elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses in the 1750s, um, he dispensed something like one quart of whiskey per vote right, on the day he was elected. Like he really came and threw a great party. And that's George Washington, right, a, a man of stature, even as a young man and presence. But still, it was the same. So that's an important thing I do kind of want to throw a little bit of light on whenever we talk about these democratically elected local assemblies and arguing for the essential ideas of rights. It's only in those 10 years before the revolution that they really take on a far more enlightenment and impassioned and far-reaching philosophical and moral tone, right? And that's where we see this change. The groundwork was laid. The connection between these classes, the tension had been lessened and the identification was there. But the real meat of the arguments, the real philosophy behind forging a democracy in the new world, a kingless democracy in the new world, was a very, very, very recent development prior to the revolution. So that's something to keep in mind. And that will conclude our lecture for today. Thank you.